So today we're coming to chapter 6 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 to 4. And also Matthew 6, verse 16 to 18. And I think often we've read as Christians and as the church has read what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. And we've looked at it and there's lots of commentators that will say this and they've said, well, it's a nice ideal, but it's not really very realistic to be able to live that way, is it? I think we need to take a different view. I'm quite a literal person and I take the words of Jesus literally. He doesn't say anything he doesn't mean to say. And what he says, he means. So when I come to the Sermon on the Mount, I've got to read it, that this isn't just Jesus saying, this is nice if you can, these are commands of him for us to live by. And that challenges me to my very core. Because the things he says here cut deep to my heart and, and cut deep to what it means to be a community of Jesus followers together here in Coventry. And we can, we can get lost in it and we can think, well, there's no way I could possibly ever live to this standard that Jesus sets. And the reality is none of us can alone. The words of Jesus, he doesn't put out there to make us feel bad. He puts out there because he knows in striving to live this way in community together is the only way. The only way to peace and joy in our lives as human beings, not just as Christians, as whole society. This is the only way. There's not another way. There's not, all faiths do not lead to God. I just want to put that out there. We live in a society that says it's okay if you have a faith. They're all kind of the same. They're not. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way. The truth, capital T, as we're talking about truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other way to God except through his son, Jesus. And the only way to a life of joy and peace here, here that reflects the kingdom of God and the only way to live in eternity with him forever, with God forever, is through his son, Jesus. There is no other way given among men whereby you must be saved, Paul says. He is the only way. And I think as Christians, sometimes we've bought into the lie that waters that down. And we're, we're to be kind and we're to love people to the nth degree. But as we read through scripture, did, you know, God so loved the world. Jesus loved the Pharisees. But we're going to see about how he's real and he's honest with them. And he wasn't like this with them to call them out, to make them look stupid. He was like this with them because he loved them and he wanted them to see that there was another way. And sometimes I think in our, our desire to be kind and to nice, be nice, we forget about the truth that sets people free. My words will not change your life. My words will not change someone else's life but his will. It's the truth that sets you free. That's what Jesus said. His words, God's words, give, bring freedom and life. Not my words. People might feel encouraged after I speak to them. People might feel enthused. They might be angry after I speak to them. They might feel better about themselves or about their situation. But it's his words that bring freedom and life, not mine. And I think, but then if, if I'm to, to administer that to people around me who are hurting and in pain, I've got to know the truth first. I've got to know his words. We used to have a thing, when I grew up in church, might have been the type of church I was in, we used to memorize scripture. We used to have this thing, Holly knows about this, we used to have this, this youth group called Awana, which was... It, 
it was just about memorizing Bible and Bible and loads of it. And Awana stood for approved workmen, not ashamed. And it feels very cheesy and corny now, but actually the message is right. Paul said to Timothy, you need to know the truth to be approved workmen that are not ashamed. We need to know God's word. We need to be in God's word because it's his words that bring life. It's his words that bring transformation. A chap who lived at the turn of the last century had this to say about the Sermon on the Mount. He said, the Sermon on the Mount is not a high tension moralism. It is a revelation of God's real power in human life. If we take our surrender to God seriously and allow him to enter our lives as light, as the only energy that makes new life possible, then we will be able to live the new life that he speaks of. Does your heart yearn for more? As Christians, does your heart yearn for more, for a different life? A life so transformed by Jesus, so transformed by the truth, in community with other people. Does it ever feel like this, there's something that's just out of your reach as a follower of Jesus? And we've said in, in, in our time in the Sermon on the Mount, it, as, as church, often we default to doing stuff, don't we? And then there was a huge push against that, which says I'm a human being, not a human doing. And, and, and we've said over the last few months, I, I think both of those are polarizing. Because God's word clearly says that if, we're, if we have surrendered our lives to Jesus, that then stuff should flow out of that. Our actions should be different. We should care for others. We should love others in real, practical, life-changing ways. If you remember going back to our series in James a few months ago, James says if we're not doing that, what we have isn't really faith. He, does, he cuts right to the chase. But so we've been talking about, we're not just being, we're not just doing, but actually what we're doing is we're becoming every day our desire is to become more like Jesus. But we've said this, this upside down kingdom that Jesus announces here requires a radical re reorientation of our lives. And our question for ourselves is, are we up for that? Every single one of us, to live the words of Jesus in these few chapters, it would require a radical re reorientation of our lives. So as we come to Matthew chapter 6, I'm going to go ahead and read verses 1 to 4, and then verses 16 to 18. And if you've got a red letter edition, most of this passage is, is in red. These are the words of Jesus. He says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen of them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honoured by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Then jumping down to verse 16. When you fast, do not look sombre as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Let's pray before we... See what God has for us in his word today. Father, as we come before you this morning, we come before you humbly, realizing that so much of our lives, if we're honest, honors ourselves and doesn't honor you. 
So many of our decisions are made for what we feel is right rather than for what you want in our lives. King Jesus, as we reflect on your words, I pray that by your spirit you would just penetrate our hearts. You would breathe a newness of life into us today. You would re-energize our following of you. I pray we would be willing to surrender it all to you once again today. Lord, forgive us for clinging on to control of our lives. For, forgive us for clinging on to our families, on, to, on, to, to stuff and so many other things. I pray we would experience the freedom of laying it all at your feet today, Jesus. Lord, as we open your word, Jesus, as we look at your words, I pray by your spirit that you would move amongst us, would soften our hearts and turn our eyes to be fixed on your face today. I pray all that we think, say and do here in this place would bring you honour and glory and praise. In your name we pray. Amen. So we, we live, unless you live under a rock, and in the age of the social media star, don't we? In the age of the vlogger, in the age of, I want to get rich quick by putting something on social media and they'll pay me for my thoughts because instantly everyone today seems to be an expert in everything. Have you come across that on online perhaps? Everyone has an opinion about everything. How many times have you been sucked into that to correct people for their wrong ideas and wrong thoughts online? Be honest with yourself. I have done the past and even on Thursday I was getting ready not necessarily with a tirade but to correct someone's wrong thinking online after the Queen had passed away but I had to stop myself I had to stop myself because I'm then God saying how is that going to affect anything other than just creating an argument online which brings glory to no one except to yourself have you, have you been there online I mean some of you aren't, aren't on social media and that's a blessing in so many ways. I was listening to a podcast about, a Christian podcast about social media. And, and, and it basically says, it's, the, the, the author of this podcast said that social media is so far gone that it's irredeemable. However, we can still act as Christians and bring kingdom values in that space. Okay. So the companies, the people who run it, and the algorithms and everything that, that dictate what you see on social media, because let me just say this, you're not the customer, you're the product. On, when you go on social media, you are the product that is being sold to somebody else. So as long as we come to social media with that in mind, you are not the customer because you're not even in control of what you see. There's this whole thing about AI programs, which the people that wrote them now honestly say they don't understand the decisions that the programs are making, which is very scary. Uh, but if you want to come to it with that mindset, we can still put out kingdom values on social media. We can do that. So what I would probably say is reserve it for that. If, like me, you get sucked into stuff enough to the side. So, but we live in an age, don't we, of the social media style. We, we have pop stars now who don't have record labels. They just produce everything online. And they have so many millions of followers that they make their money through that. It's just... Can I just say... And there's nothing wrong with... I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying being on social media is a problem. It can, often it is for lots of people. But the get rich quick and I'm going to tell you what I think on social media, that is not the way of Jesus of Nazareth. And oftentimes we get sucked into the lies, the lies that, that are told us about ourselves, the lies that, 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 are, that are spread about the universe that we live in, about the God that we serve. And we've got to come back to what we said at the beginning. It's his truth that sets us free. Someone else's opinion of you does not set you free. The only opinion of yourself that matters is his. End of. 
how many likes, how many shares, how many retweets you get for a succinct post or whatever it might be. And some of you are looking at me like, I have no idea what language he's using right now, but I know lots of you, lots of you do understand. His is the only opinion that matters. And we come to this passage here where Jesus, like I said at the beginning, is, is railing on the Pharisees. And they're not even here, but he's talking about them. He's talking about their attitudes. And as we come to these passages, and we, we, he uses strong words. He, he says, he calls them hypocrites three times in this passage. In ver- chapter 6, verse 1. He says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen of them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Verse 2, he says, when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites. Verse 5, he says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. Verse 18, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites. Three times. Because this was, the world, this was the world that the people he was speaking to saw. Remember, who, who, who was Jesus announcing his kingdom to? He was announcing his kingdom to, it says his disciples, but he hasn't yet called the twelve. Disciples is used interchangeably for his inner circle of twelve and for people who follow him in the Gospels. So he's not always just talking to Peter, James, John, etc., etc., Here we find in the end of chapter 5 that the broken, the hurting, the sick and the needy are following him and followed him him up the mountainside. And these are who in chapter chapter 5 at the start, he says, you are blessed. These people at the bottom of society says, you are blessed. And he's saying here, it's not those who, who, who look the part that are blessed, but it's you, those who have come to me overcome so many obstacles to be here you are blessed and this is what the people saw is righteous as holy as devotion in jesus here calls them out he calls them hypocrites he says this attitude does not belong in the kingdom of god the kingdom that he's just announced to these people And this attitude that the the scribes and the Pharisees and the other religious leaders, it intentionally created a divide between the holy people and everyone else. Because it said, look at me, look at how wonderful I am, and you couldn't possibly be as holy as me. And the people bought into that lie. The people bought into that lie. Often as church... Not necessarily here, but as church. Church has given the same lie. That says the person on the platform is special and holy, and the rest of you are playing catch-up. It's not true. It's not true. There are no special individuals in the kingdom of God. We're all broken. We're all sinful. And every morning, we need to thank God that his mercies are new every day. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 9 and verse 12 to 13. On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy that need the doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call the ro- for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And this happened just as the Pharisees were were criticising him for who he was having dinner with. Tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes. That's who Jesus hung out with regularly. Had parties with them into the night. Drank really good wine sometimes. This is who he spent time with. And the religious elite of the day were looking at him saying, some of this is going to rub off on you, us holy over here and polished with our cloaks and everything else, we're going to keep our distance. But he says, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. 
Think about that for a moment in what he says there. As you turn with me to Micah chapter 6. Micah 6. Verse 8 is a very familiar verse, but I want to back up a few verses here to Micah 6. Verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. See, the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes that Jesus has run against here call them hypocrites. They didn't act justly. They weren't merciful. And they weren't humble. But Jesus was the depiction of quiet humility. And you might think, oh, well, it's not, that's not a problem for me. I don't go around like that. I, I, I don't say, I don't, I don't strut up to the back and drop a big envelope in the offering just so everyone can see what I do. And I don't use big words when I pray. And you might think, well, this doesn't really apply to me. But it does. It does so much. We get a word hypocrite, and it's actually from a Greek word, which sounds similar. I won't try to pronounce it. Um, and it was, it was used in the early couple of centuries before Christ. The, 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 in Greek culture, they would have plays. And an actor would wear a different mask, literally a mask, depending on the character that he was playing. So the audience could keep up. And he was called a hypocrite. That's where the word came from. When he was pretending to be somebody else. Now, when we use that kind of language, how does that sit with us now? Pretending to be somebody we're not. Using language with others who are around us as Christians and in church that sounds good and sounds holy, but our lives don't really match up to it. In that, 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 that word hypocrite, it's not a mistake. It's not, you, it's not that you've misspoken. How many times have we heard that over the last year? In politics and so many other things. Oh, I, I just misspoke. Don't quite understand that. But anyway, it's not that we've just made a mistake, but it's a deliberate act to deceive and appear something or someone else. And again, you might be thinking, well, that's not me, really. I don't do that. We don't put on our Sunday face to hide what's really going on. We don't come in into, into community, the wider community or smaller communities with the believers and just barefaced lie that everything's fine, it's great, I'm good, thank you. Don't ask me any more questions. We don't talk the talk but not walk the walk. It's all one and the same. It's a facade. The only way we are going to see the kingdom of God break out here, physically in this place, is when we, let, when we drop the mask. When we stop pretending. When we're open and honest with one another. First, with ourselves and God. Because we do the same thing with God. When was the last time you had an honest conversation with God? A conversation that wasn't full of telling him what he needed to do and wasn't full of telling him what you wanted of him. Only then we're honest with God can, be, we, can we be honest with one another. We've got to be such a different level of community than anyone can find anywhere else on earth. 
I'll be honest with you, I think we're scratching the surface of that together. I, I, I do. Some of you come to me and I get this sense as well that you say, oh, I'm, I'm really encouraged by the sense of unity and the sense of togetherness of church. And, and last Sunday we saw that together. Getting stuck in together. Eating pizza together, even though I know some of it's not, oh, not you know, say your favourite, but we got stuck in with it together. And, and we spent time with each other. And we, some of us prayed with each other. And we just spent time in each other's presence, just having honest and real conversations with each other. I, I would say we're getting there, but I think we've got longer, further to go. And we can't do that with a glance on a Sunday morning. I'm not saying you have to live in, live in each other's pockets, but, but I'll be honest with you, when I read the Sermon on the Mount, and I've shared this with some of you this week, I understand why some people realise the only way they can live this way is physically in community with others. I'm not saying that's what God's calling us to do. All buy a big house and all move in together. But I'm also not saying that's not what he's saying, because I think that's dangerous. I think it's very dangerous to tell God what we want to do and tell him and have our own agenda. But you can understand it, can't you? And we need to have a closeness of community together. A closeness of community which is, which is open and honest with each other. And I'll be honest with you, at the moment, and we've said this as a leadership team, we have... We operate in, as a leadership team in the most unified team that I've ever been part of. And we're blessed. I'm blessed to work alongside some amazing, humble individuals who put themselves last. And we've challenged one another to say, this isn't the norm, it, the, re, the reality. If you've ever been on leadership or anything in another church, anywhere else, or even perhaps even here in the past, that is not... The norm, it should be, but it's not. So as a team, we're praying, Lord, what are you doing here? You've created this circumstance and you've created this sense of together, together in unity. God doesn't do any of that by accident. So we're saying, God, what, what, what does this mean? What are you calling us to? And as a team, we want to model what that looks like with the rest of you. And I'll be honest, we've got some work to do on that. But it's not until we get to that, that Philippians 2.5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So if you're out of sorts and you're grumpy or whatever, I don't talk about you to somebody else. I pray about it. I offer to pray with you. Or if it's really bothering me, I come to you maybe in a couple of days when I've calmed down. This is the community that we need to be because the world is so opposite to the words of Jesus. These have got to affect our whole lives, individually and together. And my, the, my question to all of us today is, who are we truly living for? I don't want you to give me the Sunday Christian answer. I want us to think about that. Who am I actually living for? How do my decisions reflect that? How do what I do with my time reflect that? How do I do... Gareth is speaking next week. Uh, if you want to read ahead a few verses. How, how is what I do with my money reflect that? And this is not a message for you to tithe to this place. Although if you don't perhaps consider it because if if by those things what I do with my time the things that are important to me and what I do with my money that's really you that's really me so we can say we live for God and live for Jesus but if none of those three things point to him then the fact is you're not and neither am I who are we really living for Remember, the stuff, everything that we see that the world tells us that we need, remember, it's the truth that sets us free. And that's not just a one-time thing in the past that perhaps you said a magic prayer on the back of a tractor, however you came to Jesus. This is a daily interaction with the truth of a living God who loves you, who knows what's best for you, who doesn't say these things to make us feel bad. He doesn't say these things to, for us to think this is another Ten Commandments. 
And I'll be honest with you, that's how we used to view the words of Jesus. You think, wow, I thought he did all that back in Exodus. But no, he says these things out of love because he knows that it's only through this life, only through this life and through nothing else can we ever find peace and joy in the kingdom of God here on earth and for eternity. This stuff matters so deeply. Don't, don't, please don't look at me thinking I've got it figured out. Because I'm on a journey here as God speaks to us together and God challenges us together as community. And as we have conversations together. And as we work this out together. And his words point to real, a reality that cuts deep that's only possible through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And in a few moments, we're going to come to communion, which cuts through, hopefully, all of the pretense, all of the masks, and everything else. And just hopefully, when we come before God, partaking of the bread and the juice, it cuts deep. Because we realize the freedom that he gave us cost him everything. I want to just close before our worship team come again. Just want to read you a couple of verses, really, really well-known passages. We've spoke about it from here. You've probably heard it in lots of places before. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. And Jesus, again, these are the words of Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. First of all, the words and the ways and commands of Jesus don't need to be tiresome. And often we, we, we take verse 28 and we like that. We like that he says he's gentle. We like that he says his burden in light, but there's a bit stuck in the middle there in verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. We can't experience unless we're learning from the King of Kings, unless we're in his truth, unless we're engaging with his commands and what he calls us to do. And once we do that, once we're learning from him, once we learn from him, we see that Jesus who is gentle and humble in heart. Once we're learning from him, we find rest for our souls. Once we're learning from him, we understand that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Because if we're trying to do it ourselves, his words feel like the weight of the universe on our shoulders. If they seem unattainable, out of reach, because they are. Without him, nothing is possible. But with, with him, anything is going to pray and then our worship group are going to come and going to lead us in a song and then we're going to come before the Lord's table. Let me pray. Father God, we want to thank you and praise you just for who you are today. We want to ask forgiveness, Father, for how often we're not even honest with you. How we hold back, how we don't even come before you, how we don't even, we make decisions without even asking you. Forgive us for our arrogance, Lord. Lord, I want to thank you for what you're doing in this place. I want to thank you for, for the community that you, that, brought, that you brought together last Sunday, Lord. And the community of God's people above all, Lord. We want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you for the sense of unity that is in this place. But Lord, I pray we would go beyond together as we seek to understand your words and what your kingdom looks like in this place as we seek to be a different community a different community from anything anywhere else on earth a community full of love and compassion and who have learned of your gentleness and humility and practice that first with one another Lord Jesus, as we sing to you, might our hearts be lifted. Might we raise our voices to you in heaven. King Jesus, we want to 
thank you just for who you are today. We want to honour you and glorify you with all we say and do in your name. Amen. Thank <clears throat> you.